The governing body is a group of men who demand absolute loyalty to them. If you are a Jehovah's Witness, a baptized Jehovah's Witness, these men demand absolute loyalty to them. Now, they'll say it's loyalty to Jehovah. But when a person is in the Jehovah's Witness group, they begin to blend those terms together. Jehovah and the organization. Jehovah and the organization. Jehovah the organization. Jehovah's organization. Jehovah's organization. And it becomes Jehovah's organization. The one becomes the same. The one becomes the other. They feel the one can't function without the other. They believe that loyalty to God equals loyalty to these guys. They believe that loyalty to these men equal loyalty to God, or as they say, to Jehovah. That's how the group works. The leadership of this group goes by a whole bunch of different names. Here's some of the names that they go by. They're called the Anointed Brothers, the Organization, the Branch, God's Organization, Jehovah's Organization, God's Channel of Communication, the Slave, Jehovah's Channel, Headquarters, the Guardians of the Doctrine, that's a name that they gave themselves at the Australian Royal Commission on Child Sexual Abuse. They call themselves the Guardians of the Doctrine. They're called the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York. They're called the Society. They're called the Faithful and Discreet Slave. All of these titles for these guys. All of these titles. You'll notice that I made the heads of these 3D images rather large. And the reason why is because these men actually see themselves as larger than life while they pretend to be faithful and discreet. This is from their December 15, 1971 Watchtower. We're going to put it on the screen for you. They made a chart of what they call the Modern Day Theocratic Organization of Jehovah's Christian Witnesses. So this is their chart of what they say is God's hierarchy, how he runs things. Now, in Christianity, we have what is commonly called the Trinity. My King James Bible uses the word Godhead. Okay, it uses Godhead. But more, people are more familiar with the term Trinity. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit make up the one God. Just like you have one body and the bo one body has several parts, you have one God, three beings that make up the one God. Now, the way they have their organization set up, according to this chart that I have that I'm going to put on the screen for you, they have Jehovah God at the top with lines beaming out of it. So they have the Father at the top, because they say Jehovah is the Father only. Underneath him, they have Jesus Christ, where it says, Head of the Christian Congregation. Now, does anybody notice what's missing? The Holy Spirit's been taken out. It's supposed to be Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, right? But the Holy Spirit has been removed in their chart and has been replaced by what it says, the faithful and discreet slave class, whom Jesus has appointed over all his belongings, the governing body. So they have removed the Holy Spirit and placed themselves in his place. If you think that's a fluke, I understand that when Jehovah's Witnesses are baptized... They're baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the, I believe the term is Spirit-Directed Organization. Remember, organization is number one of the names for the governing body. So the Holy Spirit just sort of gets pushed off to the side, and the governing body steps in in that place. And that's a very awkward position to try to put yourselves in. But that's who the guys see themselves as. They see themselves as larger than life while they pretend to be you know, these faithful and discreet, humble men. They're at the top. The next word is elders, because if you have a handful of guys and you have, they're claiming 8 million members of their group, then you're going to need some people to enforce your rules. The enforcers are the elders. These elders make sure that everybody conforms to the teachings that are handed down. If you don't conform, you're going to be punished one way or another by these elders. These elders are given secret books. They're given secret manuals. They're taken to secret meetings. They receive secret letters. These letters and books and things, they're told you're not to even tell your wife about it. Now, we're going to see whether or not these rules are upheld. I'm going to show you a quick video. Happened recently from the time I'm making this video. 
This gentleman walks up to a couple of ladies, a couple of Jehovah Witness ladies, and begin to talk to them. They discover that the main lady who's doing the talking is actually an elder's wife. He's going to ask her, are you familiar with the elder's secret book, Shepherd the Flock of God? Now that book has been out for, I'm thinking, over seven years now. I want you to listen to her answer and listen very closely to what she says. This is an elder's wife. Let's see what she had to say concerning the Shepherd the Flock of God book. Yeah, it's disturbing. It is. I mean, are you familiar with the Shepherd the Flock book? No. Um, well, it's, it's a book that belongs to the elders, and it has policies and stuff in there. So within that book, it talks about um, the fact that, you, you know, if an if a accusation is brought towards somebody, that that person doing the accusing has to have two witnesses. And they point to the scripture that says, you know, every matter must be settled having two witnesses, blah, blah, blah. So the problem that the Australian Royal Commission um, pointed out to, to the Watchtower is that because of that policy, a lot of uh, potential child pedophiles go free. But that's not correct because... It's th not? No, that is not correct because when it comes to child abuse cases, that we don't, that is not applied. Oh, it doesn't apply no. for child and that, abuse that book cases? My, my husband is an elder, so I know... The, He's an elder and yeah. you don't know about the shepherd the No, book. <laughs> because it doesn't... It, I don't think that book exists. Oh, you don't think it exists? No, no. There's no... They don't have special books for the elders and so on. I know what they have. But there's a lot of people who are against us too. Yeah. So they, they write things, apostasy. We know that. So, I mean, my dad was an elder and I used uh, to see his book in his book bag. Yeah, but and uh, he would tell me as a kid, don't, don't, you know, that's not for you. <laughs> well, they, they do have letters and things that are probably, for, you know, yeah. it's not for everyone. But they don't have special books. But I know the thing about two witnesses when things happen, you know, when people talk and so on. But when it comes to those cases, we have special letters read to us that that's reported to the police. We don't even, we don't even go to the elders for those things. If there's, a, if oh. there's a child abuse, we go straight to the police. You go straight to the yeah. police. Is that something new? No. It's always it's, been that way? Yeah, it's been that way. But, well, we, but the... we, have had, we have had letters probably within the last 20 years being read up. Yeah. Because we don't want but in the commission, to... because you know the commission in Australia, it was all videotaped and everything. And Jeffrey Jackson, your governing body, uh, testified on there. So it's interesting. I think you should see it because within that commission, they, they had a copy of the Shepherd the Flock book. So it's a real book. <laughs> and they use it in testimony. Um, and Jeffrey Jackson didn't dispute it. He acknowledged that, yeah, it's, it's one of their books that contains policy from the Watchtower. And there's also another secret book that you probably don't know about. And, it, and it's one for uh, child, um, uh, what do you call that? When child custody cases. So that's a book that if you get a divorce from your husband and you, there's a you know, battle for the kids, the society actually have a booklet that deals with how to take it through the court system. Did you know that? <laughs> I don't believe it. It's amazing. Yeah, I know you don't believe it, but it's, it's true. Well, I, I, will, I, will admit, I will ask some questions, but I don't, <laughs> I don't think that's true. Isn't that interesting? She denies it even exists. The gentleman also talked about this book here, the Jehovah's Witnesses Secret Child Custody book that I mentioned a couple of videos ago. She claimed this doesn't exist either. You're looking at it. You can see me talking about it in my other video, Hidden from Jehovah's Witnesses, The Watchtower's Other Secret Book. This is an elder's wife who's kept completely in the dark. Yet she believes she's informed. One thing that I've learned within this group is that women are very, very mistreated. They are very mistreated within the Jehovah's Witness group. And it bothers me to no end because you're going to see the extent that it goes to with this video here. I'm going to do my best to just bring all this out in the open because I think something needs to be done. Something really needs to be done. This here is the Watchtower, June 1st, 1997. Again, 
I mentioned this in the last couple of videos. I'm going to mention it again, hoping that it will drive the point home. This is the Watchtower, June 1st, 1997, page 6. It says, Their book, Jehovah's Witnesses, Proclaimers of God's Kingdom, correctly notes Jehovah's Witnesses are in no sense a secret society. It is a secret society. They deny that they are. But this whole video series would not have been possible if they were not a secret society because all of their information would have been made public. But they hide a lot of their information as you saw that elder's wife completely in the dark, completely in the dark about what's happening in her own religion. Yet she swears she's informed. It says here, true religion in no way practices secretiveness. Worshippers of the true God have been instructed not to hide their identity or to obscure their purposes as Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, we're going to see about that. If true religion doesn't practice secretiveness, then what is the Elder's Handbook? This is the August 23rd, 2010 Elder's Letter. We'll put it on the screen for you. We're going to read the uh, fourth paragraph down. It says, we would like to emphasize the importance of keeping these new books secure and confidential. Both before and after they are distributed, the textbooks should not be left on top of desks or in other places where they are easily accessible by family members or other individuals. The information is designed for use by the elders only, and elders only is in bold letters other individuals should not have any opportunity to read the information August 23rd 2010 to all body of elders letter from the governing body telling them to keep their secret book shepherd the flock of God completely secret yet they say true religion doesn't practice secretiveness October 7th a few months later some of the elders had written asking, is it okay to spiral bind the book? Now I want you to think about this. Remember what I just told you about the governing body. They demand absolute loyalty to them. They demand it. So these elders, when they got their book, they couldn't just go and spiral bind it. No, no. You got to get permission from the guys up top before you can do something as simple as spiral binding a book. That's how much control these governing body members have over the members. If you don't understand that, you're not going to understand the motivator behind Jehovah's Witnesses. This is a group that functions out of fear. That's how it works. That's how it operates. Nonetheless, the leadership writes back, and I want you to listen very closely. Remember I told you how women are mistreated within this group. The leadership does not trust the women, and the women don't understand that. Hopefully their eyes will come open with a video like this, because when they see what they've been doing with the women, hopefully their eyes will come open and go, wait a minute, I didn't know that was going on. Let's see what it says here. It says, Dear Brothers, since the release of the new shepherding textbook, several elders have asked about the possibility of having their textbooks spiral bound. There is no objection if any elder personally spiral binds or laminates his own textbook or does so for others. If he has another baptized brother who is not an elder do the work for him, the elder must watch while the work is being done. Outside companies, unbelievers, and sisters are not permitted to do this work. They labeled the sisters next to unbelievers. Outside companies, unbelievers, or sisters are not permitted to do this work. The material in this book is confidential and confidentiality must be preserved. A secret book from a religion that says true religion doesn't practice secretiveness. And again, the ladies get slapped down. You see, there's no women in the governing body. It's 2017. No women in the governing body. No women elders. No women overseers. The women don't get positions of power. 
we're going to see what's going on, guys. We're going to see what's going on. The next word is Judicial Committee. Before we get to that, there's another video. This is a speech from the leadership, one of the governing body members. If you don't believe what I'm telling you when I tell you that the leadership degrades the women. If I was to ask you, if you're a lady and you're watching this, if I was to ask you, what is your purpose as a woman? What would your answer be? I'm certain that your answers are going to be far different than what you're about to hear. I'm going to play for you what the governing body member of Jehovah's Witnesses said concerning what the th purposes of a woman is. Ready? Hear the audio. Because upon the creation of Eve, man became a kind. Thus we have man kind. Because woman is a kind of man. You know, there's three reasons why you're here. You know what they are? That is women. Number one is to serve God. And of course, that's why we're here too, to serve God. That's foremost. But now the second reason why you are here, women, is to feel the need of me. And the third reason why you're here is to give the man of your choosing, these are the three reasons why you live and why you exist. And women are well equipped for this role. You know your desire from childhood is usually to marry and please your husband. Think back to the time when you were just a little girl. What did you enjoy playing with the most? What did you want to play the most? I can still remember my sister saying, let's play house. <laughs> Always. It could be raining, it could be doing anything, let's play house. Now we may have wanted to go play cowboys and Indians, but the girls in Vera want to play that. So that's nothing out of harm. It's good that you have such desires even when you're young. You see, every woman has what it takes to please a man. Some women fail to use what they have properly, causing much unhappiness and sorrow. You know, scientists say that the cranial capacity of a woman is 10% smaller than that of a man. So now this shows that she's just not equipped for the role of she. Her role is one of subjection to the man. Her role is that of submissiveness, and that means that she should recognize that she is a woman and be glad to be a woman. But now what does it mean to love your husband? Now we know that all you sisters present this evening love your husband. Or at least you want to love your husband. But now what does it mean to love your husband? Well, you should cooperate with him. That's what it means. You should cooperate but never compete. You would recognize if you truly love your husband that you're not equipped mentally, emotionally, and physically or somatically for the role of competition. Is your blood boiling yet? They don't trust the women, but they'll use the women, but they don't trust them not even to spiral bind a book. The next word is judicial committee. Now you want to talk about women in a judicial committee. A judicial committee is the Jehovah's Witness court system, but don't confuse it with your normal court. It's not like a normal court. In a normal court, you have your evidence, your opponent has their evidence, they take the evidence, they present it to the judge, and the judge weighs the evidence to see who's telling the truth. That's not how the Jehovah's Witness court system works. If you're pulled into the back room,
In the Judicial Committee, there's usually three guys sitting there. Sometimes there's more than three, but there's usually three guys sitting there, and these guys are going to sit there as your judge, jury, and executioner. And usually, if they're pulling you into the back room for a Judicial Committee, they've already determined that they're going to punish you in one way or another, whether it be a public reprimand or whether it be kicking you out of the group. If you're getting pulled into the back room, They've already decided what they're going. It doesn't matter how much evidence you bring to prove that you are innocent. It doesn't matter. If they're pulling you in that back room, more than likely, they've already determined, as far as they're concerned, you've broken the rules, or as one elder said, the customs of the Jehovah's Witnesses, and you're going to have to be punished for it in some way, shape, manner, or form. Now, what about the women? Remember, there's no, no women in the Judicial Committee. So what happens when a woman is pulled into the back room? I'm going to give you a few stories of women who were pulled into the back room. And it would be one thing for me to sit here and tell you what these elders did to these women. But I think it's more powerful if you heard the women themselves. So ladies, I'm going to give you the floor. And let the world know what these elders did. You see, these things happen behind the closed doors. And when the elders do their dirt, if things don't go the way they want them to go, they'll just kick the woman out of the group. And when someone's kicked out of the group, nobody else is allowed to speak to them anymore. So they can't go to another member of the group and say, hey, you won't believe what happened to me back there. Because that person from the group, the moment they see them coming, if they realize that person's been kicked out of the group, that Jehovah is going to turn around the other way and leave. They're not going to speak to them. I want you to hear firsthand what these people had to say, these ladies, about what happened to them in this so-called judicial committee hearing. Behavior. Wendy, too, had to describe her rape in agonizing detail to a specially convened meeting of elders held in her own living room. So I had three very elderly men whom I'd never met come into my home and they all, three of them were making notes like this and I then had to recount it again to them and they wanted to know every little detail. Um, I'm not sure if I want to broadcast this, but they uh, were very interested in how far apart my legs were. And I had to demonstrate. So it was excruciating. They asked me that if he was touching me and did I see his manhood and all sorts of things. And they said to me, don't be embarrassed. Nothing you can tell us will shock us. Nothing. And what happened as a result of that? As a result of that, they then went to Mark and interviewed Mark and his wife. Same same procedure. And then they had a meeting and then they brought us together at the Kingdom Hall of Barry. And what happened there? We were interviewed. We were not allowed to speak to each other. I had to go through it again in front of Mark and his wife. And then I had to sit and listen to him giving a completely different account. This approach to bring together the abuser and the abused to confront one another in a so-called judicial committee held by the elders is totally at odds with current thinking about sexual abuse. Despite its title, this is, in essence, a church committee of untrained men. Yet it's elevated to the status of a court by the Jehovah's Witnesses and can decide whether a crime such as rape or child abuse has taken place and how the perpetrator should be dealt with. Wendy again. After that judicial committee, I was quite traumatised emotionally, very depressed, very anxious. So me and my ex went to Portugal for a week's respite. And when we came back, that same committee called to see us and said, it's your word against his, there is nothing we can do. When I challenged them and said there are actually two witnesses because Karen has given you the same experience, albeit slightly different, it's still abuse, I was told quite categorically that the, the two could not be linked because she was a minor and I was an adult. 
left, so it didn't matter that it was the same pattern of behaviour by the same man. No. Not to them. Jehovah's Witnesses have been accused of failing the victims of child sex abuse after a case in Manchester where a man who was convicted of sexual assault was allowed to cross-examine his victims. The Charity Commission, which regulates the religious group, said the questioning was inappropriate and demeaning. One victim described the meeting as worse than the court case. An audio recording of the meeting has been passed to our social affairs correspondent, Michael Buchanan. This is New Moston Kingdom Hall in Manchester, where Jonathan Rose spent years as a senior member. In 2013, he was imprisoned for nine months after being convicted of the historical sexual abuse of young girls. Jehovah's Witnesses went to expel him, but Rose appealed, which led to an extraordinary gathering. A meeting was called between eight male elders, a convicted paedophile and his female victims. Over the course of an evening, the women had to recount what had happened to them, while he, Jonathan Rose, got to interrogate them. Each woman was questioned separately. One secretly recorded her grilling by Jonathan Rose. What I'm saying to you is this didn't happen. Now give me one reason, one reason please why I would have done it to you. I had no reason to touch you, we were friends. At one point, another man in the room asked the woman, if she'd egged Rose on, and no one prevented him from discussing graphic details. What was I supposed to have done to you that night? Please explain to me. Not to be perverted, was I, what, did I touch you down below? Did I touch your breasts? One victim said she didn't even know Rose was going to be at the Kingdom Hall. She went in the belief the congregation were going to apologise to her with protected identity. He kept making out I was lying. He kept saying, why did I make it up? Why would I say something like that? And at no point did I feel like he was going to admit it. So as soon as I knew he wasn't going to admit it, there was no remorse, no sorry. That's when I felt like I'd had enough. I just got to the point where I thought, he genuinely believes he hasn't done anything wrong. Her mother, who supported her, was appalled by what unfolded. I felt guilty because I should have been protecting her. It shouldn't have been allowed. That meeting should not have been allowed, ever. Jehovah's Witnesses say this evening that they've robust child protection policies and put appropriate restrictions on anyone found guilty of sexual abuse. Today's report, however, said their actions in Manchester failed the women. It has to be dealt with in a way that is sensitive to the victims who have gone through this terrible or ordeal, but also in a way uh, that the public would expect this to be dealt with, and in this case, they let the victims down. Though Jonathan Rose was expelled from the Kingdom Hall, the meeting here should clearly not have happened, and the Charity Commission have wider concerns about how Jehovah's Witnesses handle sex abuse allegations and are carrying out a broader inquiry. Michael Buchanan, BBC News. was good. I liked it. I practiced at home. We had a piano at home. I loved it. It was truly my passion. He was my piano teacher. A talented man who was well known in our religion. An elder. A family man. A role model. What was he doing? But in fact, uh... Week after week, at each piano lesson I had with this man, he masturbated in front of me. He also asked me to touch him. You would get out of your piano lesson, and your dad was there waiting. I couldn't look him in the eye. Melanie was 10 years old. Her weekly nightmare lasted five years. In her teens, she quits piano and starts dating a boy which is very much frowned upon by Jehovah's Witnesses. Melanie is reported. She's summoned to a judicial committee, the church's internal court. Her punishment? A public rebuke in front of the faithful. Who was behind the punishment? It was my piano teacher. It was my abuser. So it was your abuser 
who was judging you for your behavior with boys. Yes, exactly. Pathetic. I can still see him, to my left, with his accusing eyes. I can see him and yes, at that moment I would have liked to yell it out to the room. What stopped you? Forget it. What I would have said, my testimony would have been brushed aside, that's for sure. Benoit is Melanie's father. He was the one waiting for his daughter's lesson to end while her piano teacher was allegedly assaulting her in the next room. I would never have imagined in my worst nightmare that such a thing could have happened. Impossible. It takes some nerve to do that to a child when you know her dad is just on the other side of the door, just in the next room. It takes a lot of nerve. Had I seen it, it would have ended badly. Melanie keeps her secret for nearly 20 years, until she meets a second alleged victim, a meeting that convinces both women to come forward. The piano teacher is called before two judicial committees. Melanie arrives at hers with her father and her husband. We stopped at the side of the road before arriving, and I told my husband, I won't be able to do it. Take me back home. It's impossible. I will die. I thought it would be difficult, but it wasn't difficult. It was catastrophe. A catastrophe, because Melanie is forced to tell all, in front of her alleged abuser. It's a core rule among Jehovah's Witnesses, drawn from an interpretation of Bible verse. If I hadn't agreed to confront him, my testimony would have been worthless, so, of course, I was the only woman there, sitting in my little chair. And I had my abuser very close to me, at the table. He asked me questions, he asked me. You've got it wrong, it wasn't me that this happened. It's impossible, your memories are wrong. Why do you want to do this to me? So that evening I was re-victimized by that man. Right after the committee, I went to the bathroom. And I really didn't feel well, severe headache, dizziness. I even lost consciousness. When I saw my daughter on the floor, it was like he had hit her. It was he who made her crash to the ground. I went crazy. I lost it. I was escorted from the hall. I was hitting the walls. I can't believe they can't find a way to respect biblical principles and at the same time do it with more love and compassion towards the victims who are traumatized. After the testimony of the two victims, the piano teacher is expelled from the Jehovah's Witnesses. He then appeals the decision. Melanie has to repeat the process two more times before the excommunication is upheld. But it doesn't last long. Now there are some of you out there who wonder, if all these things are going on, how can you haven't heard more about it? Well, it's real simple. These are some articles about child sexual abuse cases that have taken place here as early as 2022. Jehovah's Witness leaders know that in child sexual abuse cases, most likely they're going to lose. So they pay the victim millions and settles out of court. There's so much evidence against the Watchtower worldwide about child sexual abuse, child molestation, incest, all kinds of various different things. They know if they go into court, there's so much evidence against them, they don't really stand a chance. So what they'll tend to do is they'll go into court and they'll just choose to settle. Now, I want you to put yourself in this position. You've been sexually abused inside the group. You're suing them. In the courtroom, they say, okay, we're going, we want to settle. We don't want, to, we don't want this to go through the court because they don't want the stuff to get out in the public. The leadership is very, very interested in their squeaky clean reputation. But that squeaky clean reputation comes at a price. And the price is the safety of the Jehovah's Witness member your life on the line, your health on the line. But they don't care. 
They're concerned about their reputation because with their clean, squeaky clean reputation, they're able to rub elbows with these multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar companies. They're able to do things, go places, and be invited to places that they would not be invited to if people really knew what was going on. The reason why you don't hear a lot about it is because when they choose to settle these cases in court, the person who sues them usually ends up getting millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. But they have to sign something called a gag order before they'll get the money. The gag order, you can look it up online. You're not allowed to talk about the case. You got to keep the lip zipped. You're signing a contract saying I will accept this money in exchange for not talking about what happened. Now let's just be honest guys. All of you who have YouTube pages against the cults. What if a representative of the cults came to you and said we'll give you a million dollars to take your website down. But you got to sign this contract that from this day forward, you won't say anything publicly negative about us. A million dollars in your bank account. But you can't say anything negative about the group anymore. If you do, you signed a contract saying you wouldn't do it. So if you do end up speaking negatively about them after they've given you the money, now they can turn around and sue you for three, four, five million and bankrupt you. Now, how many people do you know would take the million dollars, two million dollars, five million dollars, ten million dollars just to keep their mouth shut? That's why you're not hearing so much about it publicly, guys. Roll the video. Well, victims of this kind of abuse say it is the worst kind. People of faith preying on people who pray. The group Silent Lambs was in Nashville today showing their support for people who say they've been abused by Jehovah's Witnesses and others. Recently, lawsuits were settled in some cases, but not to the satisfaction of Silent Lambs. Channel 4's Cynthia Williams is live now at Kingdom Hall in West Nashville with the story. Cynthia? Well, there are about six Kingdom Halls in the Nashville area, including the one here in West Nashville that's over my shoulder. And today, Silent Lambs attached this bulletin to the door of each one. At least, that attempt was made. And so, uh, recently, 16 lawsuits were settled. Who called you? Silent Lambs met with vocal resistance today at a Kingdom Hall in Woodbine. You haven't been invited? on the property. For six years now, the Kentucky-based organization has offered support for people alleging abuse within the Jehovah's Witnesses faith. In March, settlements were reached in more than a dozen molestation cases, agreements that came with gag orders attached. We find this bittersweet. On one hand, we're glad a few victims were finally getting some financial help, but on the other hand, we're sad and worried because they've essentially, they've been forced to give up their right. Bill Bowen is a former Jehovah's Witness and founder of Silent Lambs. He was surrounded by abuse victims today from various faiths. When I was around eight years old, I was molested by a teenager who was a member of my church at Christian Gospel Temple. There are thousands of us out there and thousands of children that need our help right now. My parents nor anyone else ever knew that I was abused by an elder. According to Silent Lambs, the Jehovah's Witnesses policies encourage abuse by not reporting allegations to police, choosing instead to handle individual cases internally. Today, a stuffed lamb was placed on the doors of area kingdom halls, telling victims they need be silent no more. And victims groups say that they are critical of these gag orders because they tend to keep the identity of the predator secret while re-victimizing the victim. Live in West Nashville, I'm Cynthia Williams, Channel 4 News. The Jehovah's Witnesses headquarters in Brooklyn was supposed to send a faxed response today, but as of news time, we had not received anything. That's why you're not hearing about it. They're selling out of court, millions and millions of dollars. Remember, the Jehovah's governing body member comes on JW Network talking about there's more money going out than coming in. 
Mm -hmm. Sure is. And there's going to be more money going out too, Watchtower. A lot more. Because there's going to be a lot more people suing. A lot more. Earlier in the video, we talked about how the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses do not trust the Jehovah's Witness women. They don't even trust them to spiral bind a book. They're afraid they're going to look at it, read it, and talk about it. They don't trust the women. Here's another case here. We have a Jehovah's Witness elder being questioned under oath in a court of law. The questioning is because the government of England, as well as the government of Australia, the government of Canada, and the United States, as well as other countries, have learned that the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses keeps a massive database in these countries of the known criminals that are hiding within their group, which includes pedophiles. They keep very detailed records about who these people are. In England, they were told to turn over the database so that the government can know who the criminals are that are hiding within the Jehovah's Witness group. The, mainly the child sexual abusers. They wanted to know who these pedophiles are. But when the leadership in New York found out that the government of England wanted the database, they sent out a message to the elders to destroy all the documents. Well, this elder under oath is going to be questioned as to why it is they destroyed the documents. And I want you to listen very closely to what happens here because this elder is just going to get caught in his words and he's going to be left sitting there looking real dumb. I want you to listen very closely to what he says also about the elder's wives. Take a listen. But for the whole congregation, it would have repercussions that would flow through. And the matter was reported to you because you were in a position of responsibility? Yes. Did you take any notes? No, I didn't. Um, can you help I us? I may have done at the time, I'm sorry, but... Um, you may have done. I may have. But Where are they, they now? They would have been destroyed. Why? Um, we don't like to have any notes outside of what's kept on file in the congregation. Why don't you like to have notes of a serious allegation? There, there are brief notes kept in the file, but all other notes are, are destroyed. Why is that? Uh, I, I, I guess it's because we don't want them to fall into the wrong hands of other people to find them and, and they go through them. What are the wrong hands? Um, well, we don't want our wives knowing what our stuff, um, what sort of things we're dealing with. We don't want other people in the congregation coming across that information. So you want to keep it secret to the elders, is that what it amounts to? I don't know about secret, but um, we want to try and limit the amount of people that have to have a look at that information, yes. And why is it that you want to limit the people who will have access to the information? Just to protect them, I guess. And we don't... As protect, protect who? Protect the person that's uh, involved in it and the rest of the congregation so that they don't have to know these... Um... I don't know, it's just, just the protocol that we've had in, so we just follow that information. Yeah. And would you do the same thing today if someone came and reported to you a serious allegation of sexual assault? Would you destroy any notes? Yes, that's our practice. Um, and what about telling other authorities? Are you aware of your obligations if someone tells you of a serious allegation of sexual assault? We... If, if we have any hesitation, we contact the branch for advice on how we should proceed legally and scripturally. Um, we don't attend, or we don't report it to the police. I think we encourage them to do that, but we give them the assistance to do that if they need that. How do you encourage people to report to the police? I 
my standing's a little bit unclear because I've never had to do it, so I'm, I'm not fully aware on the process. But um, if if it did come to me, I would be just saying, you know, this is a matter that you need to talk to the police about or the legal authorities and, and pursue it that way. It is very surprising to sit back and listen to these men talk. The Jehovah Witness leadership is all men. No women in the hierarchy. Yet the women, as you can clearly see here, they're mistreated. Many of them are abused and not even trusted to do something as simple as spiral binding a book. You have here an elder under oath who has a wife. This wife trusts this man to get inside her body. He doesn't even trust her to see his secret book that was given to him by the leaders of the group. Why? Because the leaders told him not to show it to his wife. That's why. Not to show it to anybody. If the leaders told him to show it, he'd show it. So who has the authority as far as this elder is concerned? The leaders do. Whatever the leader says goes. And that's sad. Because people's lives are destroyed because of the leaders and their bad decisions. Now we've talked about here women who have been sexually abused. We're going to go to the next level here because there's another level of abuse that has happened within the Jehovah's Witness group that I put right up there next to a woman being violated the way you have seen here. I feel that there is nothing really that comes close to the violation of having your child taken away from you because you left a group. But there's been a number of cases where women have left a group and they had elementary school age children. And they thought that when they left the group, they were safe now. But they had no idea that the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses were not done with them because they left. They despise them now because they left. Far as they're concerned, if you leave the group, you've turned yourself over to Satan, the devil, and they want nothing to do with you. But they also have this doctrine called Armageddon. Their Armageddon doctrine has been taught to their members for about 140 years or more, and their members keep falling for it, so the leaders keep using it. This is the Armageddon teaching in a nutshell. Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that the world is going to end at any second. Now, how is it going to end according to them? According to the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses, the world is going to end when the Jehovah's Witness Jesus, who they say is Michael the Archangel, comes down to this earth with his armies and kills every man, woman, boy, and girl who is not a 100% loyal Jehovah's Witness. So even if you are a Jehovah's Witness, if you are not considered as loyal enough, their teaching teaches that that Jehovah's Witness is going to be killed at Armageddon too. So if somebody leaves the group, since they're told that Jehovah's Witnesses are the only ones that are going to survive, if somebody leaves the group, as far as they're concerned, that person has turned themselves over to Satan. They've doomed themselves to die in Armageddon. And if they took their elementary school age children with them, as far as their religion is concerned, they've also doomed those children to die at Armageddon. This has led some people within the group to go to radical measures to get the children away from the parent who left the group. How far have some Jehovah's Witnesses gone to snatch away a child from a former member? Take a listen to this news report to get an idea. Out of the tragedy in Toledo, three young children, two adults killed, all of apparent carbon monoxide poisoning. Police found the bodies of 54-year-old Sandy Ford, her 32-year-old son, Andy Ford, and her three grand grandchildren, 10-year-old Paige Hayes, 6-year-old Logan Hayes, 
and five-year-old Madeline Hayes yesterday. Toledo police call it a murder-suicide amid a custody battle. Lee, the three kids were students at Whiteford Elementary School here in Sylvania, and the district superintendent says grief counselors were at that school in every single classroom all day for students and teachers, and they will remain there as long as they need to throughout the next few weeks. Now, the superintendent says this is um, a tragic and shocking for not only the community here for the school community district wide, but we went back out to the neighborhood and the neighborhood is still in shock as investigators release new gruesome details. It's leaf collection day on Harvest Lane. A street haunted by the gruesome discovery inside this family garage. This is an absolute tragedy. Um, we've lived here 15 years and nothing like this has ever happened in the neighborhood. Kelly Lewandowski lives two doors down from where yesterday emergency crews used a sledgehammer to open the barricaded garage door. Police found five people dead inside a Honda Civic with hoses leading into the car from the exhaust of a Dodge truck left running. The bodies are 10 year old fifth grader Paige Hayes, six year old second grader Logan Hayes, and five year old kindergartner Madeline Hayes. Also dead, pictured here, their grandmother, 54 year old Sandy Ford, and their uncle, who is not in the picture, 32 year old Andy Ford. Police call it a murder suicide, saying the grandmother and uncle killed the kids and themselves because of a custody battle. It is literally something that happened in our, my own backyard and it just never, never realized anything like this could happen. It's going to take everyone to help with the healing process. The superintendent of Sylvania City School says there is a counselor in every classroom at Whiteford Elementary School. It's going to be a longer process with our, our fifth graders, uh, but even at the kindergarten and second grade, there was sitting in a circle and talking about the, the student uh, that is not with them today that, and that we've lost a friend and what does that mean? It was the grandfather who called 911 yesterday asking police to come out after he got home. He found suspicious notes from his wife, son and grandchildren and then he couldn't find his wife and he couldn't get in the garage. We reached out to him today as well as the parents of those children. They're not commenting as this investigation continues. Kids parents Mandy and Chris Hayes reached out to the agency for help with behavior issues for one of their five kids. Now to help alleviate some of the stress on the family, the parents asked the grandparents to watch three of the children. When mom and dad wanted the kids back, that's when we apparently saw yesterday's tragedy. Well, you know, that's not an unusual uh, family situation. We see that kind of uh, uh, families feuding and fussing uh, a lot. Obviously, this dispute went much further, further than anyone expected or imagined last Wednesday and Saturday when officials with Children's Services visited both the parents and the grandparents' homes. In this case, we had just begun, so we were in the process of trying to figure out what's the best way for any of us to, to act. The three children who lost their lives lived here on Harvest Lane since 2009. Dean Sparks, the executive director of Children's Services, says the custody dispute triggered the Wednesday visits. Uh, this was a, a, a reportedly is, is very similar to many situations that we have, uh, particularly if somebody's been caring for a child for a, uh, a little while. Um, uh, I don't want them to go back. They're not ready. They're not going to take as good care of them as I can. When Children's Services visited the home of the parents, Mandy and Chris Hayes, Saturday, all the kids were with them. The parents always maintained their legal parental rights. So the big question everyone wants answered now is what could have been so bad at the parents' home that Sandy Ford, their grandmother, would want to take their lives? We're only in this for a couple of days. Uh, so we are saying what's so bad about it, we don't know. We only know that there's a lot of conflict or allegations back and forth. Children's Services cannot prevent a removal. Spark says they were working with other service providers to get this issue resolved. Now, there's one gap in this story between Saturday when mom and dad had the kids and Monday when they were found dead at their grandparents' home. At some point in there, the kids were moved to their grandparents' home. At this point, no one is commenting on exactly what happened. Okay. Now, you just heard this news article tragic grandmother uncle kidnaps three kids takes them to their home kills them it's terrible beyond terrible but there's something that was left out of the newscast so let me fill you in what they didn't tell you is Sandy, the grandmother, and the uncle 
who killed those three kids were Jehovah's Witnesses. The mother, Mandy, had left the Jehovah's Witnesses. You see, it's important to do your research to get down to the bottom line of things and find out what's the real story behind the story. <coughs> There's a website that keeps track of Watchtower crimes. It says here, Toledo, Ohio, Ford family murder suicide, November 2012, Toledo, Ohio. Jehovah Witness grandmother named Sandy K. Ford, age 56, accompanied by her 32-year-old son named Andy R. Ford, plotted to execute a joint suicide pact in which they also murdered three children of another daughter of Sandy Ford named Mandy Lynn Hayes, who reportedly no longer followed the Ford family watchtower cult religion. That was left out of the newscast. They're saying they can't understand what would motivate this woman to kill these three kids. It says here, Mandy Hayes had dropped off the three kids at school on the following Monday morning. However, Sandy Ford was waiting for them inside the school. We're going to deal with that. The last paragraph says, the school had informed Mandy Hayes that her children were not in class, so she reportedly telephoned Toledo police in an attempt to check to see if her mother had kidnapped the three children, but they refused to even make a welfare check at the Ford home. The news media forgot to tell you these people who killed these kids were Jehovah's Witnesses. Why did they kill them? Because the Jehovah's Witness religion teaches them that anybody who leaves the group is going to die at Armageddon, including the children, and that only those that are in the group are going to survive this Armageddon, which they say is right around the corner. So when Mandy left the group and took her kids with her, far as their religion was concerned, she just doomed those kids to die at Armageddon. So the grandmother and the uncle took it upon themselves to quote unquote rescue those kids. We call it kidnapping. And they felt the children were better off dying with Jehovah's Witnesses than living with an ex Jehovah's Witness. There's your missing link. You see, the Jehovah's Witness religion teaches them that if you die, you just go to sleep. Oh, the lies that are told by the Jehovah's Witness leadership. As I mentioned to you guys in video 10, part 1, the Bible simply says that Armageddon is the Hebrew name for a place. The Bible never said Armageddon was a war, a battle, or anything else. It simply said they were gathered together to a place in the Hebrew tongue called Armageddon. It's simply a place. But the Jehovah's Witness leadership has redefined Armageddon and turned it into this global disaster in which they keep their members in constant fear of. So much fear that when Mandy Hayes decided to leave the Jehovah's Witnesses and take her three kids with her, these zealous Jehovah's Witnesses who believed in this Armageddon doomsday scenario took it upon themselves to kidnap her kids and in the name of saving them from an Armageddon that the Bible doesn't even talk about but the Jehovah's Witness leadership talks about they murdered three kids and the news media forgot to tell you the Jehovah's Witnesses were behind that murder-suicide. There's been a high-profile kidnapping that came to light. Some of you remember J.C. Dugart, right? J.C. Dugart. She was snatched right off the street. 
right in front of her house. Hidden. I believe it was 18 years. 18 years. Something very important about the people who kidnapped her. This here is the living conditions that J.C. Dugart lived in. Look at this. Locked away in a building that was soundproof. She could scream all she wants. Nobody on the outside could hear anything. This young girl had her youth taken away from her. Had her innocence taken away from her. So I'm going to play for you the first part of a newscast that aired back in 2011. For those of you who didn't know about the people that kidnapped J.C. Dugard. Take a listen to this. As we resume, seven months have now passed since J.C. Dugard was taken from her mother, her sister, her life. That field trip she worried about, long over. Her fifth grade classmates have now graduated elementary school. Her mother is still pleading with everyone to keep on searching for her. She is coming home. That gives me a lot of hope, a lot of optimism. Somebody's, you know, feeding me dreams for a reason. And by the way, her biological father had left the family, was never in J.C.'s life. There was a stepfather, but J.C. was not close to him. Two hours away, J.C. is now being moved back and forth from the soundproof room to the larger room where she's handcuffed to the bed. Her only company, a spider, she names Bianca. Then one day, Garrido says there's someone he wants her to meet, and he wants them to be friends. She enters the picture. Yes. Nancy. Nancy Garrido is his wife. They had met in a visiting room at Leavenworth Prison. He a prisoner there, she visiting her uncle. She a Jehovah's Witness. He talked to her about the Bible. She was also in the car the day J.C. Dugard was stun gunned and kidnapped. She was the one who pinned the little girl to the floor with her legs. That's right. The people who kidnapped her were Jehovah's Witnesses. <clears throat> There's an organization out there. 1997. The ICSA. I'm going to put it on the screen for you. They took the time out to interview Jehovah's Witness women. The topic is wifely subjugation, mental health issues in Jehovah's Witness women. It's a very long study, as you'll see. One of the questions that was asked of these women got a very interesting answer. So I want to present it to you. It says, symptom scale. The most common fears reported by women in the survey were fears of death and or destruction. Now, they were asked the question, what do you fear the most about leaving the group? What do you fear the most? What do you think is going to happen to you if you leave the group? These were the answers they got back. The most common fears reported by women in the survey were fears of death and or destruction of the world by God at Armageddon. Fear of abandonment was also cited in several cases. Several women reported fear of being harassed, stalked, or having their children kidnapped by WTS members. Having their children kidnapped by Watchtower Society members. People inside the group know that this kind of thing goes on. I tip my hat to these ladies for being honest enough to admit it. You need to keep an eye on your kids. You really need to keep an eye on your kids if you have elementary school age kids. This is what I've learned. <clears throat> the children that are usually taken are elementary school age or younger. 
They don't usually bother the teenagers because if the teenagers are indoctrinated enough, if the parents don't go along with them being the Jehovah's Witness, they'll just leave on their own. But the elementary school age kids, it's a whole different story. A teenager, if they're forcefully taken, they can find their way back home. Elementary school age or younger, not the case. So they tend to focus on elementary school aged kids and younger. Secondly, they're usually taken by either their Jehovah's Witness parent that does not have legal custody over them, sometimes taken during custody battles, sometimes after a custody battle if they lose. Just because you win the child custody case does not mean they're going to leave you alone. Just because you win the child custody case does not mean that down the road they're not going to try to swing around and grab your kid. I want to give you a heads up so that if your kids disappear, you will know what happened. You'll know. I want to give you the warning signs. I want to give you the sword so that you can fight your battle. This one's very important. The children are usually taken directly from their elementary school. So let me start there. If you are divorced from, separated from, going through a child custody case against a Jehovah's Witness, male or female, and you are the legal guardian of those children or that child, you need to notify their school immediately that if anybody comes to that school asking to see your kids, talk to your kids, claiming that you sent them to pick up your kids, they are to get on the phone and talk to you personally to verify. If they didn't hear it from you, it didn't happen. If they don't know that you and that Jehovah's Witness are not together anymore, or you're separated, or you're divorced, if they come to the school, far as they're concerned, they're just handing the child over to their mom. They're just handing the child over to their dad. They don't know this person is not the legal guardian. They don't know what this person is actually planning to do with that child. They need to be told. And if you're watching this right now during school hours and you haven't yet contacted your school, I would pause the video now, call up the school and let them know. Don't wait till it's too late. It takes them just a moment to go up to that school, find your kid, grab your kid, put your kid in the car, and they're gone. You need to make sure there's people watching your kids. If you've left Jehovah's Witnesses, you need to make sure there's people watching your kids. You need to notify the babysitter, the friends at their houses they go to, where your kids go to. Let them know. If anybody comes wanting to pick up my son or daughter, the kids claiming I sent them, you get on the phone and you call me and you verify whether I sent them or not. Let me ask you this. You were a Jehovah's Witness. You brought your kids to the kingdom hall with you regularly. Now you've left the group. Have you deprogrammed your children yet? What do I mean? When you were a Jehovah's Witness, you trained your child to do certain things. Let me explain. You trained your child to listen to the elder, to obey the elder, to reverence the elder, to fear the elder. Can't doze off when that elder's talking or you're going to get pinched, right? Remember Caleb and Sophia? When that child was not paying attention when that elder was talking, what would happen to the child? They'll be taken to the back room and have the stuffing beat out of them. Or taken to the bathroom and have the stuffing beat out of them. They had put within them 
a fear and a reverence for the elder. Now that you are no longer a member of that group, that cult, have you sat down and talked to your child and told them the elder no longer has authority over you anymore? Not only do you not have to listen to him anymore, but don't listen to him anymore. And you need to tell them if that elder shows up at your school, on your playground, at your friend's house, while you're going to or from school, on the school bus, in a store, wherever you happen to be, if that elder shows up anywhere, you are to run with all your might in the other direction and you are to scream for your life. Because their life might actually depend on it. Don't forget what the Ford family did. If those kids had been warned that if any Jehovah's Witness comes to you telling you to get into their car, you run! Kid's mother didn't think to warn them that if any Jehovah's Witness comes and tells you, come get in the car, don't get in their car. Don't do it. You run the other way. You run as fast as you can and you find somebody to protect you. Why is it so urgent? It's real simple, guys. Do you know what will happen to your kids if they get them? Let's say they manage to grab your kid today. Do you know why it's going to be nearly impossible to find your kid? From what I've learned, if they get their hands on an elementary school age child of an ex Jehovah's Witness, they take that child across the border to another country. They may take that child across a number of borders to other countries just to make sure that you can't have access to them. That child's well-being is not important to them. All that matters to them is they don't want you, the ex-Jehovah's Witness, with the child. Whether that child is good, taken care of, fed, clothed, doesn't matter to them. Doesn't matter to them. They just want to make sure you don't have access to the child. So what I want to do is I want to take the time out to give you guys some cases. So you can see that I'm telling you the truth. And you got to be careful. You got to keep an eye on your kids. From here forward, you got to keep an eye on your kids. You got other people keep an eye on your kids. I don't want you to get your kids taken. I mean, I'm a single guy, no wife, no girlfriend, no kids. I can't relate to somebody having a child taken because I've never had one. But I don't want it to happen to you. We're going to start off with the case of the kidnapping of Cindy Flulick. Cindy Flulick was a little girl at the time. Her mom and dad devout Jehovah's Witnesses. But over time, Cindy's mom began to get more and more disillusioned with the Watchtower. More and more. Finally, it reached a point where she said, you know what, I'm done. No more door to door for me. No more going to meetings. I'm done. But as you know, you can't just leave the Watchtower. They will punish you if you try to leave. You know that. Such is the case with her. When she decided she wasn't going to go to the meetings anymore, they decided to punish her. So what do they do? The way the pattern usually works is this. You have a husband and wife that join Jehovah's Witnesses. Let's say in this particular case, the wife wakes up and she realizes that it's, it's all junk. She wants to become a Christian. She wants a King James Bible. And she wants a Jesus of the King James Bible, the one that loves, not, not the one that guides you through fear. She wants the real God. She doesn't want the Watchtower. The first thing they'll try to do is they'll try to get her to come back. 
If they're convinced that she's not going to come back, then the next step is going to be to put her on trial, Judicial Committee. Now, whether she comes or whether she doesn't come to the committee hearing, they're going to disfellowship her anyway. It appears a lot of these kidnappings, they don't want to do it unless the person is disfellowshipped. Because once the person has been disfellowshipped or kicked out of the group, then all the other members of the group are not going to speak to them anymore. So if their kids disappear, they can go and question all the Jehovah's Witnesses they want. The other Jehovah's Witnesses are not going to talk to them because they're a former member and they don't talk to former members. They're told not, you can't talk to them. They're apostates, as far as they're concerned. So they want to make sure the person is disfellowshipped. So that's the next step. Now that the person is disfellowshipped, they have another problem. You have a Jehovah's Witness, her husband, who is now married to an ex-Jehovah's Witness, and they don't allow that. So that's where we end up with this. A divorce and child custody case, where they will use a book like this, or the different variations of this book that we talked about in an earlier video, to try to manipulate the court system so that the judge will rule in the Jehovah's Witness's favor. They will do all they can to try to make sure that the judge does not allow religion to be talked about in the courtroom so that the judge will never find out what they really teach the children. And this book and the other books that they made like it are used in that fashion in child custody cases. And we talked about it a couple of videos ago to help Jehovah's Witnesses win child custody cases by lying to the judge. Now, let's say you still end up winning the, the case. The ex Jehovah's Witness parent still ends up winning the case. As I said earlier, don't drop your guard. Because just because you won the case does not mean the Watchtower is going to leave you alone. Mainly if you have elementary school age children. So in the case of Cindy Flulick, when the mother decided she didn't want to be a Jehovah's Witness anymore, the Jehovah Witness dad worked together with the elders and he went in and he grabbed Cindy. This is a map of the Americas. Cindy was kidnapped here, Toronto, Canada. Cindy's mom got the police involved to try to help her find Cindy. She hired a private investigator. There was even a news investigatory program that joined her to try to help her find her daughter. Eight years later, you heard me correctly. The Jehovah's Witnesses hid Cindy from her mother for eight years. How were they able to hide her so successfully from her mom? Let's put the map back on the screen. Cindy was kidnapped here in Toronto, Canada. Eight years later, they find Cindy here. Over 10,000 kilometers away, over 5,300 miles away in a place called San Diego in Chile in South America. Now, do you think her mom in a million years would have thought that her daughter would be taken to another continent? She would have never thought her daughter would have been kidnapped, much less kidnapped and taken to another continent. And what was the mother's crime? She hadn't committed any crime. She just left the Jehovah's Witnesses and they decided to punish her by taking her daughter from her. Now, if you want something to make your blood boil, I got it for you. After finding Cindy, they made a couple of discoveries. And one of the discoveries was that the elder at the kingdom hall where her mother used to attend and the elder's wife, they both knew all along where Cindy was. And they lied to the police, and they lied to the private investigator, and they lied to the mother for eight years, claiming they had no knowledge of where Cindy was. But six years after Cindy was kidnapped, the elder's wife went down to San Diego in Chile to see Cindy. 
She knew exactly what house she was in. She knew exactly what kingdom hall they were taking her to. She knew it all. And they lied to all the authorities and caused that mother eight long years of anguish and pain and loss. Eight years she could never get back with her daughter. And they showed no remorse for doing it. That's part of what makes us so angry. They do it and feel no pain. They put you in pain and they feel no pain. It's one thing for me to sit here and tell you the story. It's another thing for you to see it for yourself. Remember I told you a news investigatory program tried to help her find her daughter. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you a video that probably this is the only place you'll find it. And I'm hoping you'll take it and spread it all over the place so that people will know that this kind of thing goes on within the Jehovah's group. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the kidnapping of Cindy Flulick. Tonight you're going to see how that community sanctioned the kidnapping of a little girl. Cindy Florick was caught in the middle of a family breakup, one that got her mother kicked out of the Jehovah's Witnesses. But Cindy's father, in a misguided effort to save his daughter's soul, abducted her. There were many witnesses to what happened, but they became silent witnesses when Cindy's mother went pleading for help. She was one of Child Klein's first poster girls, little Cindy Florick, missing at age five. Her mother, Anna, was frantic. I, I tried the best. I tried anything. And nobody could help me. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have any friends. Cindy was taken by her father, Joseph, now a resident of Santiago, Chile. Over eight years and two continents, he used, neglected, and finally abandoned the girl. But there was one person who took pity on Cindy. She was a very sad girl, lonely, hungry for love. There was someone else less sympathetic. This church elder knew where Cindy was, but he didn't tell police or Cindy's mother. It was a private matter between him and his church, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Church spokesman, Walter Graham. Did your organization at the national level attempt to assist in finding Cindy Florick? No, we didn't get involved. Why not? Well, first of all, we didn't know where to go. And secondly, uh, Mrs. Florick was no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Ana Gonzalez was raised in Mexico in a devout Jehovah's Witness family. She was just 17 when she met Joseph Florek at a witness convention in Mexico. They married and moved to Toronto. The church was the center of their life. Three meetings a week, plus door-to-door -door preaching. Even the odd night out was in the company of Jehovah's Witnesses. But after her daughter Cindy was born, Anna began to rebel at the restrictions of life as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I was curious about the outside world. He wanted me to spend more time preaching and go from door to door and uh, going to the church and spending more time in the, um, the church. That's what it was the main point. Three years after Cindy was born, Joseph and Anna separated for the first time. Joseph took Cindy and fled to Saskatchewan. Their church stepped in and brought them back together quietly. When we were separated the first time, um, I wanted to call the police. And they told me, no, it's not necessary for you to call the police. Who told you that? The elders. And why do you think they would tell you that? Because they didn't want nothing to do with the law. The elders convinced Joseph to come back home with Cindy, but the marriage didn't last. Within a year, the couple separated again, and this time it was for good. Anna began to live the life she felt she'd missed out on. She got a job, 
and she also got a boyfriend. Shortly after Anna took steps towards a legal separation, Joseph Florek came looking for his daughter. Five-year-old Cindy hid under the bed. I didn't want to go with him. Did you, were you afraid of something? Did you think he might be taking you away again? Well, I thought something, I, I knew something bad was going to happen, but I didn't know why. What? When Joel took Cindy the second time in 1982, Anna's relationship with the Jehovah Witnesses was on the rocks. She wanted nothing to do with them. Six months after that abduction, elders from her congregation sent her an official request to attend the meeting to answer the charges of sexual misconduct. Anna didn't show up, so Joe Florek's accusations against her stood, and the church disfellowshipped her for adultery. The community that had been her entire life now shunned her. Her own mother was forbidden to speak to her. They don't care about a disfellowship person because they think we're bad evil. That's what they think. I'm disfellowshipped, that's it. Dr. Jim Penton is a leading scholar of the witness movement in Canada. This fellowship in 1981, Penton knows all about shunning. I know literally dozens of children who will not speak to their parents. I know brothers and sisters who will not speak to one another because one has left Jehovah's Witnesses and the attitude is that these persons are bound for destruction unless they repent. Is it possible that members of the community could be unmoved by the torment of a mother? If the child goes to the mother and is raised as a non-Jehovah's Witness, then the child dies eternally too. And they'll say, well, it's better that the mother, who is after all an apostate, should suffer. Joseph and Cindy lived in this Toronto house for two years. It was just a half-hour drive from Anna's place. But old friends in the church wouldn't help her. She was an outsider now, alone. Anna met Peter George six months after the abduction. They were married in 1987. He became her moral support. Peter also financed the search that would dominate the next three years of their marriage. I never gave up. Never. It killed me for a long time. Suffering inside for a long time. I think that's something that still angers us now is that we lost so many years or wasted so many years in anger and in highs and lows because of a religion that, uh, you know, was obviously doing a great deal of wrong. In 1984, Joseph Florek, still a witness in good standing, had taken Cindy to Orlando, Florida. They rented rooms in this house from a Jehovah's Witness named Tony Trujillo. I would like to see again. You'd like to see Oh, him? I love it. The man and the girl very good. Cindy and other witness children attended this school, a private school. Its records weren't registered with the state. Joseph became a member of this congregation soon after they arrived in Florida. This elder told us he employed Joseph as a carpenter and paid him in cash. There were no employment or income tax records. Joseph always covered his tracks, but this had serious consequences for Cindy. When she was eight, she pulled a pot of boiling water off the stove and was badly burned. Her father kept her away from the hospital for three long days and nights. Did she cry a lot when she had the burns? No, 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 no. no. You don't that we could hear it? The only thing I... I it would be normal to assume that it hurt. Were you crying a lot? Yeah, I was screaming. Scared? It hurt a lot. Do you often wonder why it was your father didn't take you to the hospital immediately? Mm hmm I wonder, but I don't know why. The reason seems clear enough. By this time, 1985, Joseph was wanted in Canada and the United States for child abduction. Maximum sentence, 10 years. Bank accounts, phone numbers, and hospital records can be traced. As long as he stayed underground, the police and Cindy's mother would have a hard time finding him. It was much easier for his church to get information about Joseph Florek. Congregations always request a new member's service record from the last congregation he attended. That record includes any moral violations. The dirt on Joseph Florek's church record seems to have warranted some discipline. But elders stopped short of informing police or insisting that Joseph Florek 
returns Cindy to her mother. Mr. Souza, no comments. I told you. Would I be able to ask you? No, no, no comments. Mr. Flores, no comments. Sorry. I asked the elders if they would talk about Joseph Flores, and they said they wouldn't do so on camera, but they did admit that they knew him and that he worshipped here. And interestingly enough, they also admitted that they had checked out his past. And based on what they had found out, they limited his privileges to preaching door-to-door -door and attending services here. But what they wouldn't allow him to do was preach to the congregation, hold the position of elder, or attend national or international conventions. The elders, the leaders of the organization, they all have control of situations like this. And I know for a fact. They all have control of a lot of people in there. They all know about you. The organization is completely hierarchical, and the average witness won't do anything unless he receives instruction from an elder or a circuit overseer or someone at the branch office or watchtower headquarters. The chances are 99% that some of the elders some of the uh, senior leaders of the witness movement in Toronto knew the circumstances. The Watchtower Society near Toronto is highly computerized. It's part of an international organization with two million magazine subscriptions worldwide and all addresses are kept on file. When Anna George came to this organization pleading with individuals to help her locate Cindy did any of those individuals have any idea where Joseph Florek was? As far as I know, they had no idea. It's obviously uh, a very well thought out plan by Mr. Florek. A plan in which he was assisted by many Jehovah Witnesses. Uh, but none of them knew the whole story. Certainly, if we had knowledge of the whereabouts of Cindy, Cindy we would have uh, certainly uh, acted. But we didn't. Theologian Jim Penton says witnesses are taught not to lie, but they can be evasive. The fact of the matter is that the Watchtower Society has said, well, anyone who is an enemy is not entitled to information, not entitled to the tr uh, truth. Lying to the enemy. Who is the enemy? The enemy is anyone who uh, works contrary to the teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses. The secular state, a disfellowshipped person, Anyone such as this is the enemy, and therefore one can use theocratic war strategy, and they do. Could you tell us a little about theocratic war strategy? Theocratic war strategy. <laughs> what is theocratic war strategy? That's a good question. <laughs> theocratic war strategy. And, uh, Have you ever heard the term? I've heard the term, but it's a very old one. Do you employ it? Do the Jehovah Witnesses employ theocratic war strategy? I don't think I have, no. Maybe not yourself, but do Jehovah Witnesses employ theocratic war strategy? I don't, again, I, I can't comment. I don't know of any circumstances where we have. And I insist that officials with the Watchtower Society knew more than they shared with her, police, or child find. You know, you know that I'm well, where is my daughter? And you know while well, you've been talking to Joseph, but you just don't tell me. He just said, I don't know anything. All the while, Cindy had no idea she was the object of an international search and in her mother's constant thoughts. Do you ever miss her while you were away? Yeah, I missed her a lot of times. I always went to bed and, and thought about her. And thought if she, I was thinking of, if she was thinking of me. Early last year, Anna and Peter hired private investigator Tony Turco. Turco says he approached between three and four hundred people for information, almost all Jehovah's Witnesses. Most parental abductions, uh, people would assist and go the full nine yards in assisting to locate the child. Uh, with the Jehovah's Witnesses that I talked to, uh, they had no real compassion for the mother. Um, I guess in mind that uh, Anna was not a practicing Jehovah's Witnesses any longer. By the time Turco got his first big break, Joseph and Cindy Florek didn't live here anymore. They had moved to the other side of the world, Santiago, Chile. Once again, they were among friends, silent witnesses, to Joseph Florek's crime. Joseph and Cindy's journey ended here in Santiago, 
10,000 kilometers away from Anna. With all that distance between them and no extradition possible, Joseph's fear of being caught relaxed. He opened two fast food restaurants with money from his mother. He got a listing in the phone book and applied under his own name for a permanent visa. Cindy went to this private school for the children of Jehovah's Witnesses. We found the school's owner, and she was kind enough to show us Cindy's classroom. Miss Maji remembers Cindy as a quiet girl, unhappy because of her home life. She recalled that Joseph's mother suffered from Alzheimer's disease. Her behavior was bizarre, often violent. She told us that Joseph worked at his restaurants from early morning to late at night and said it was nine-year-old Cindy's job to cook and clean for all three of them. The Florex lived in this apartment block across the street from the school, but Cindy hardly ever got out to play. I used to be locked in my room because of my grandmother. Because um, she didn't know I was living in that house. She thought I was, I was not there, but I was there. I always had to be silent. I couldn't even go out for, to the bathroom. He left me a little box. <laughs> it was... And you did your toilet in a box? Yes. The little girl who wandered this schoolyard was finally noticed by someone else. Tobolkova's children attended Cindy's school. A devout Jehovah's Witness, Anna saw a child clearly in need of help. I became her friend during recess. I got to know her loneliness, and I talked about it with my husband, and we invited her during the weekends, and we became very fond of her. Joseph Florek was content to have his daughter stay with Anna and her family. It got rid of a constant sore spot with his mother, and he could devote more time to his restaurants. He also promised Anna he'd help with Cindy's keep. In truth, on many occasions he said his business wasn't going well, so the person who kept and educated the child was my husband. What did Anna do for you emotionally? She took very good care of me and gave me a lot of love that I needed at that time. Before she met you, what were you feeling? Sadness. A lot of sadness. Why was that? Because I was lonely. Because my father almost left me abandoned. And um, I had to do everything for myself. What was life like at Anna's house? It was like being with my own family. And being one of the family meant Cindy got daily religious training. When she turned 13, she was to be formally baptized as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, along with her foster brother and sisters. But there were other things she had to learn first. It was very difficult for me, and I think for the kids, too, because she didn't have any rules of hygiene, so it was almost like teaching a baby. Did she start to adjust quickly? Yes, and I became very fond of her. I get the impression that it became a very caring and loving family, that it became very close for Cindy here. In truth, it was a family of five children. All Anna knew about Cindy's mother was what Cindy had told her. She was a bad woman and she had left the church. That was Anna's understanding until she was visited by three people from Toronto. The visitors were members of this man's family, Pedro Robb an elder of a Toronto congregation and past friend of the Floric family. His wife Myrta and their two daughters visited Cindy at Anna's house in the spring of 1989. 
She told me that she knew her beforehand from Canada, that she was a good woman, that she missed her daughter quite a bit, and that she needed her, that she was very sad that the girl was here and not with her mother. What did you think when Mrs. Robb told you that about Cindy's mother? I was very saddened, and this was the reason why I wrote to Canada, telling them that Cindy was with me and how we had met. I really don't know what happened with that letter. That letter was sent to Pedro Robb. He chose not to mention it to Cindy's mother or discuss his reasons with the Fifth Estate. At the same time that Anna Tobolkova was writing to Pedro Robb, the private investigators were already closing in. Their big break? A secret bank account in the Cayman Islands with a Santiago address on it. With the help of Interpol, Cindy was located. Eight years after Joseph Florek had kidnapped his five-year-old daughter, Anna flew to Chile and brought Cindy home. <laughs> <laughs> Anna and Cindy have eight years to catch up on. They live outside Toronto where Anna works as a hairdresser. Cindy's new father, Peter George, is a chef. Her new sisters are called Casey and Amy. Um, just a little bit, not too much. I'm happy, but I'm sad because I have to leave my foster mother. And I'm happy because I have my real mother beside me. So it's like I have to split my love in two. Are you angry at Joseph Florek? I was mad at him. I felt pretty mad at him. Now I feel pity for him. What would you say to him if you had him in front of you right now? Poor guy. You're such a coward. I feel better for you. What would you say to him? Why? Why did he do that? Why didn't he do it the the good way? Why did he take? Why did he have to take the rough way? I asked Joe Fork the same question, but he refused to come across the street and talk on camera. And the man who knew of Cindy Florek's whereabouts years before she was located also refused to speak to us. Could you, could you tell me whether or not you know Joseph Florek? Were you aware that Joseph Florek kidnapped his daughter and took her to Santiago? Could you answer why your wife went to Santiago and to spoke to Cindy? What would your reaction be if you found out that an elder of a congregation in Toronto knew the whereabouts of Mr. Florek? probably all along. Yeah, I'd be surprised to hear that, yes. Would this be serious? I would say so, yes. You have an elder in a congregation in Toronto, Pedro Robb. Do you know? Uh, no, I don't know him at all. Mr. Robb's wife visited Cindy at a foster home in Santiago. What's your reaction to that? Well, that's, what, seven years after the abduction? Yes. Uh, then uh, when did they know about the abduction? Uh, when did they know uh, of the location? I, I really can't comment. Has head office ever been contacted, ever been faxed, memoed, lettered regarding the location of Cindy Flork? Over the last, uh, what is it, uh, eight years, uh, there has been no correspondence on Cindy Flork. So national headquarters has no correspondence from Chile, from Santiago, copy to you from the congregations anything like that that not sure. that i know of your files wouldn't indicate anything not the files i have no could we see the files well we have, this is the extent of my files which are, are very sparse indeed and that was 86 that's from uh, where's that from this is from santiago santiago in 1986 that's right what does that say it's in spanish is there a translation this is from Pedro Robb. That was from Pedro, yeah. Saying that he did not inform us where he was moving. So Pedro Robb received communications in 1986 from Santiago, according to this document. Yes, and that's his reply. From what I gather, in, 19, here, in 1986, the congregation in Santiago, Remember, Chile, wrote for information regarding Joseph Flores. Yes, to, to Mr. Robb. And Mr. Robb's reply saying that uh, he informed them then in 1986 
of the situation that the, he left the country violating the court ruling of his wife's custody of his daughter. Why is he not informing the congregation in Chile that Mr. Flork is wanted for kidnap and that any information would greatly assist in returning Cindy to her mother? You have to ask him. He must have contacted national headquarters. No, there was no copy of the national headquarters. Well, then why do you have a copy? Well, I'm sure we have... Doesn't that surprise you? You're holding that file, and it says in 1986 she was in Santiago. Yes, uh, I have it here in my file now, but uh, from my understanding, we didn't have access to that uh, bit of information until just very recently. What is your organization going to do? Is it going to call in Pedro Rob? Has it called in Pedro Rob and said, explain this? Uh, there has to be some sort of investigation. Certainly, this whole matter is disturbing to any caring person, whether they be a Jehovah's Witness or otherwise. We're concerned and we're very happy that the mother has Cindy back. Even though Anna George is disfellowed? Yes. Disfellowship doesn't really come into the picture. This is a mother-child arrangement. But mother and daughter are still separated by Cindy's eight years of religious immersion. Cindy, how do you feel right now about being sort of away from the church? It's, it's different. Is it difficult on you? Yeah. Do you feel one day you may go back to the church? I may. The Jehovah's have had Cindy for 13 years of her life. And if she's prepared to give us the next five, when she's 18 years old, she's a full-grown adult. She can make whatever decision she she feels is uh, mm -hmm. is right for her. Anna Tobolkova has found it hard to get used to life without Cindy. She finds comfort in her church, but she wonders why Cindy hasn't written. I received only one letter from her a month after she left. I've written to her every week, and I get no response. What would you like to say to her? That we love her. And that we're very happy that she's with her mother. Anna George read those letters. They were full of religion, so she never passed them on to Cindy. I'm afraid of that. I'm really afraid of that. That I want, I don't want anybody to bother her right now. Why are you afraid of that? We're going to be in the same shoes my mother and I are right now. We don't have any communication. She cannot come and sit with me and talk to me and eat with me, socialize with me. They can't. Does it worry you that if you do return, you might have to shun your mother? That's what bothers me. Can you shun your mother? I don't know. It's going to be a tough decision. The day before we left Santiago, Anna told us she was dying. She has a brain tumor and it's inoperable. She asked us to speak to Cindy's parents and convey her wish to see Cindy one last time. Do you know that Anna is ill? Cindy's foster mother says she wants to come and visit Cindy. How do you feel about that? I don't really like the idea, but if that's what Cindy wants, then she's welcome to come, except she cannot talk about religion to my daughter. She cannot push her religion to my Cindy. The meeting took place two weeks ago at a Toronto hotel. Please. <laughs> 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 
This was a time for reunion, and there was no talk of religion. Now that you've seen it with your own eyes, you see how serious this is. How deceptive the Jehovah's Witness group is. One of the places that Cindy was held, as you saw, was a building built by the Jehovah's Witnesses with a cross on it. Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in the cross. So no one would have even thought that this was a Jehovah's Witness building. Yet, there it was. And the government of Florida had no idea that that building was even there. Why? Because one of the things that Jehovah's Witnesses are known for is building their own buildings. So how many of these secret buildings disguised as Christian establishments were actually built by Jehovah's Witnesses to hide kidnapped kids? How many of these are around the world? And who would have ever believed that Jehovah's Witnesses would be involved in stuff like this? But you're seeing the evidence, and I'm not stopping here. There's more. Case number two, Laurie McGregor. Laurie McGregor. She was given a speech recently. And in her speech, she made a very important statement. And what I want to do is I want to play for you a little bit of an video that she did a couple of years ago in which she's talking about her book and talking about her life and I want you to listen very closely to the exact words that she used when she talked about what she would see at Jehovah's Witness conventions and Jehovah's Witness assemblies I want you to listen very close to what she says now, when I was a Jehovah's Witness, I remember at times at conferences and conventions seeing a couple of kids with a couple that I knew they didn't have those kids. And I inquired, well, where did those kids come from? Well, guess what? They were kidnapped kids from across the border, taken away from a custodial non-JW parent, and they were being secretly raised in the organization so that they would survive Armageddon. I didn't know that I was going to be one of those victims. But the organization now went for my children. Stan had repented as their fault state for Armageddon grew closer and then formed an evil alliance to take away my children. The details are here in my book. But they recruited JW members to bear false witness against me under their justified lying doctrine. And there was even an attempted kidnapping. So you heard her say it with her own mouth. What she would see at these conventions were people who had children that she knew didn't have children. And when she asked who they were, she was told straight up, these kids were kidnapped from where? Across the border. Remember, the elementary school age kids, they'll always take them across the border. This here is a audio from a few years ago, many years ago actually, in which she's talking about the exact same thing. And I want you to take a close listen to what she has to say because she has experience as well in this area. Take a listen to this. So they feel that unless they leave the home situation, they'll have no hope for a future life. Jehovah God will destroy them all without a second thought. They're living under tremendous fear because they feel that Armageddon could come very soon. Uh, we've heard of numerous cases where the non-JW mate arrives home to find what? An empty house, mate, children, furniture, even pets missing. The bank account might be empty as well. And your children may be hidden with a Jehovah's Witness family in another location if they feel that they can come after you. I can remember being at assemblies and meeting up with people, and they had a couple extra kids, and I said, well, who are these? Well, they were kids from a custody case. And they had them in hiding. They, had, they said, better they be raised by Jehovah's Witness strangers than that mate that won't become a Jehovah's Witness. They'll do it. Don't think for one minute they won't do it. They threatened me with that for my own children. They said, we're 50 miles from the U.S. border. And once we get across the border with those children, you'll never see them again. Don't 
think that it won't happen. It does. This is her book, Absolutely Impossible, by Laura McGregor. I recommend you check her out. It's her own story and her own words. Chapter 7, page 27. I hope Laurie doesn't mind me just reading the small portion. It says, Poison Propaganda. There was one kidnapping attempt at this time. I had spoken to the school principal and the teachers at my boy's school. See, she informed the school to be on the lookout. Just like I told you. I knew that children were often kidnapped by non-custodial JW parents and spirited away, usually across the border. This is prior to passports, etc., that protect children now. These days, to get around passports, oftentimes they'll just drive the kid across the border. Or they'll get the Jehovah's Witness parent to get a passport for the kid, and off they go. It says here, uh, they would be placed with a strong JW family who undertook their upbringing in the organization. See, they will put them with a Jehovah's Witness family that will indoctrinate them day and night in a foreign country. All the JWs were comfortable with lying to the authorities as Armageddon was near. It's always the Armageddon Doomsday button. Gotta press that Armageddon Doomsday button, brother. Gotta press that Armageddon Doomsday button. Sorry. The button doesn't work. Armageddon is a place. It's not an event. I'm not going to read her whole story. Because this is Laurie's copywritten material. And I respect her. But what she said was, the elders appeared on the children's playground. The elders showed up at the kids' playground. At recess. And tried to grab her kids and put them in a car. But the principal was watching. He had the sword unsheathed. He was ready. When he saw these elders trying to grab her kids, he went out there and made sure that her kids didn't get taken. Absolutely impossible, the name of her book, guys. Trailblazer. I believe that these were things you guys needed to know, from how women are abused within the group to how people are punished when they try to leave. I think these are things people need to know. People ask me, you know, I've never been a Jehovah's Witness, so why do I care what's going on over there? Well, I understand that as a Christian, I have a responsibility to defend my faith. And the Jehovah's Witnesses are claiming to be Christian when their religion is not Christian. They are literally taught to believe the opposite of what we fundamental Christians believe. We believe Jesus is God. They say he's not. They say he's Michael the Archangel. We believe Jesus died on the cross. They say he didn't. They say he was nailed to a torture stake or impaled to a torture stake. We believe in what's commonly called the Godhead or the Trinity. They say the Trinity is the doctrine of the devil. We believe that there's a literal burning fiery hell that Jesus came to this earth to protect us from. They say hell is just a grave. We believe your sins are forgiven by the grace of God and not by your own works. You cannot earn God's favor. Jehovah's Witnesses are taught that they have to earn their God's favor by going door to door, attending endless meetings, following and being loyal to the leadership of the group, shunning former members, etc., etc., etc. All the rules that they're told they have to follow in order to please their God. And after they followed all the rules, they're still not guaranteed that they satisfy their God and they sit on their deathbeds and lay upon their deathbeds hoping that they've done enough to please their God. If my video can help bring back one child that was kidnapped, it would be mission accomplished. No one should have their child taken away from them because they leave a religion. No one should be punished in that manner. It doesn't make any sense. And mainly when the Jehovah's Witness group pretends to be this clean, wholesome, pure, godly Christian organization.
while they have this beautiful mask on, once you get behind the mask, you realize there's something really evil there. I don't want people to get caught up into this because this group can be very creative and very crafty to lure people in. And then once you're in, it's like you're stuck in a spider's web and you're trying to get out for your life and you just can't seem to get out. Some of the people are happy with the spider's web and it's sad because they don't realize what's happening to them until it's too late. And sadly, some never figure it out. Now, as for me, I'm not going to leave you guys just hanging like this. I want to at least give you some words of hope. People ask me, how do I get someone out of the cults? My response is, you don't let them go in in the first place. Because cults are designed to lure you in and never let you escape. And if you try to escape, you're going to escape with a lot of pain and bruises mentally and emotionally. Jehovah's Witnesses are no different. They'll gladly welcome you into their group with open arms. But if you try to leave, you're going to find yourself punished and punished harshly, whether it be a public reprimand, which is being humiliated in front of the other members, or whether it be getting kicked out of the group, what they call disfellowshipping, getting shunned, or whether it be having your children snatched from you after you've left. The least I can do is try to warn people. And if they still decide to become a Jehovah's Witness after I've warned them, my hands are clean. I tried to warn you not to go in there. People who join cults like Jehovah's Witnesses join because they think that they're going to be at peace with God by joining a group like this. But that's not the way you become in peace with God. Jesus Christ came to this earth and he showed us the way because he is the way. We were to come to him so that he can take us to the Father, not come to some organization so that they can take us to the Father. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, not by an organization, not by a religion, by his Son, Jesus Christ. His Son is called the Word of God multiple times in the Bible. And the Bible itself is called the Word of God. In English, we've had the Word of God for nearly 400 years called the King James Bible. And you can learn about God and our history here on this earth as humans and our future. It's all spelled out there in the King James Bible. If you want to be at peace with God, it's actually really simple. You pray and you ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins. All of us have sinned. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned, and as sinners, we need forgiveness from God. So Jesus comes, and he's the one that has the authority to forgive you. Nobody else does. You come, and you ask him to forgive you of your sins, and he forgives you of your sins. And you go on, and you live your life, and you let him rule your life. It's not a bunch of you can't do this, can't do that, can't go here, can't go there, can't listen to this, can't listen to that. That's not what it's about. That's not what it's about at all. The Bible says God would that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. That's all he wants. He wants us to repent and come to him because he has a much better, better life in store for us once this one's over. So, guys, I hope this video has been beneficial to you. I hope it's been informative to you. And feel free, again, to check out my music site, jasonzelda.com. I write original songs and I uh, try to have some fun with my music, and uh, I hope you guys will enjoy it. And we're going to end this video without any music this time. The video is long enough as it is. If you want to check out my music, you can listen to it for free on my music site, jasonzelda.com. And the site is also designed in such a way that you can pay any amount that you want for the songs. If you want to pay a dollar for a song, you can pay a dollar for a song. If you want to pay 500 for a song, you can pay five, whatever you want to contribute to the ministry, you can do it that way. And at least you're getting something back for all your money. Because I don't, I'm not somebody that asks people for money. I just don't feel comfortable asking people for money. But at least you're getting back something for your money by doing it that way. And if you can't afford to buy a song, don't worry about it. My site is designed in such a way that you can just go on and listen to all my songs for free. So, that's the way I choose to do things, and I'm hoping that these videos are helping people. And until next we meet, I will see you guys down the road.